Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of The Metagame, the live streaming, real-time, interactive YouTube chat program in which we'll talk about board games, but also sometimes talk about talking about board games. I'm your host, Chaz Marler, from Pair of Dice Paradise, in conjunction with The Dice Tower. And we're going to get started here with the actual show content um, as soon as I get a uh, confirmation from the YouTube chat area that the audio and video is good. And I see I re have received a confirmation from the YouTube chat area that the audio and video is good. So, excellent. So, in case this is your first time watching, hello. And uh, here's what this show is all about. Um, I am going to present a topic of discussion, something related to board games or board game media content creation. And I'm going to present a, a small presentation about it. And then we are going to turn over to the live YouTube chat area. And we're going to go there to see um, other people's questions, comments, uh, statements, and ideas on the topic. And we'll kind of bounce back and forth. And um, so if you are watching this as it's streaming and you have something you'd like to contribute to the show for have uh, consideration, uh, make sure that in your YouTube chat, uh, you add the hashtag TMG. That will, uh, for the metagame. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my web browser's neato search feature to highlight the uh, chats that have that hashtag in it so that they kind of rise to the top. And that's how we will... Uh, communicate together and I'll, I'll find the chat stuff uh, for, for the show. All right, so today's episode is titled Board Game Archaeology uh, because I was recently visiting the thrift store looking for oddities, gems, or other, or other neat little games. And I, I came across a few games from the 80s and 90s and there was just something about the way they produced that stood out to me for some reason this day. And I was looking at some of the components and mechanisms in these games, and I realized they, they just don't make them like this anymore. And it got me thinking about, like, uh, if you were to go back in time to, like, an archaeologist, going back, looking at how board games have evolved over time, you know, would you really see that much of an evolution? Are, are Have board games really, is it just because I'm so close to the hobby, but have they really changed over the years? And uh, so I have found a few examples of things that either I think have evolved or become obsolete or are about to become obsolete as board games evolve into the next thing that they're going to become right around the corner. So we have a little bit of history and a little bit of future prediction in this episode. So I have a list of some of the things I've seen change in board games over time. And as always, I'm also going to be bouncing into the YouTube chat to see what uh, everyone has to say. I'm going to highlight the YouTube chat right now, uh, get that highlighting started. Uh, because um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do it in the right browser window because that helps. So, because uh, I've noticed even before the show started, there was some preliminary chatter going on, and you guys have already mentioned a couple of things on my list. So, but I'm not going to spoil my list yet. Um, I'm going to, uh, I have some visual aids with me and stuff, but before I get all of my, to my visual aids and everything, I'm going to continue the way I was going to present this, and that was with a nice little uh, analogy of um, opening a box here. So, I anyway, do. okay. For example, here's my beginning of my list. Let's say I'm at the thrift store, and I grab a typical game from the 80s off the shelf. So... Uh, the first thing that I notice before I even open the box is the box itself. Uh, most of these games come in these, you know, it seems like they would come in the long boxes. You think about the traditional game of Monopoly or Life or Sorry, you know, any of those games, mass market games from the 80s and 90s. And uh, you think about any of those games and you, all, you always think about the long boxes that would not necessarily uh, fit on uh, like the uh, Ikea shelves that are so popular these days. Yeah, they're the long skinny boxes. And, and I'm not exactly sure when that changed, but it did change. And it's one of those things 
that makes me wonder if it was uh, a change due to necessity um, as production changed, or if it was something that was done purposefully to try and make modern games stand out uh, as more modern and a different type of approach. But those long boxes um, were, you know, a, a total pain because they're flippy and they're floppy and they're thin, so the components fall out whenever you try to put it up on the upper shelf of your hall closet and then all your little plastic houses and ponds, you know, fall out on your face and you gotta bend down in your shag carpet and pull out these pieces and you're getting cat hair and carpet fibers as you're trying to pull them out. You know, then you don't even care anymore and you're stuffing them back in the box and you get it in the shelf. So the next time you take the game out of your game closet, everything Things just a mess. You got fuzz all over in, in your games, and, and they just don't make them like that anymore, do they? Um, apart from possibly the Lords of Waterdeep box, which perhaps for nostalgic purposes tried to recreate uh, that um, nice thin, not closing very well box uh, experience for everyone. But other than the Lords of Waterdeep box, I can't think of any others that uh, purposefully are are thin and floppy like like that. Um, okay. So th there's the box, um, but I'm not done yet because when you open that box and you flip it, op flip it open, the first thing you'll notice during your flippage is that the rules for a lot of these games were written on the interior of the box top. And that's something that you just don't see anymore. Um, and it's another one of those things that I wonder, is that out of necessity? Or is that just uh, because games have gotten more complex? I mean, there's games like, you know, Onitama, looking at my game shelf across the room here. Oh, see, Onitama, code names, definitely. Um, you know, and other games that are so simple that I assume their rules could technically have been written on the interior of their box top. But it's just not something you see anymore. There's always the, the rules sheet, you know, and, and so, is that done so the game could be printed in multiple languages easier? Uh, so color can be introduced. I'm, I'm sure you can do color on the interior of the box top if you, if you really wanted to. Is it a price thing? Is it actually cheaper to print the rules um, on, on little paper pamphlets that you can lose immediately after you purchase the game? Or you know, is it just because um, having the rules in a box top dates the game or would appear to, and so it's something that a modern board game purposefully does not do in order to avoid that stigma of being seen as an older game. Is this all about evolution or is this all about appearances? Um, so the, the other thing about the, uh, the stuff, noticing that there's nothing printed in box tops anymore. Um, I'm gonna move over to the YouTube chat here real, real quick, but before I do, I was gonna mention that um, I was thinking about the interior of box tops, you know, and, I, and and there's really no, I can't think of any game, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of any game that utilizes that box top interior real estate. And I realized that as this industry continues to grow, I think one of the determining factors, how we will know when the board game industry really hits mainstream mentality, and be you know, and, and really becomes uh, closer to more mainstream, like movies and uh, video games and whatnot. Is when we start to see advertising actually inside the interior of the box tops, and especially if we start to see advertising, not for uh, when we start to see non-board game advertising appear in that box top. When you see that, you'll know that board games have the attention of the mainstream marketplace. Because if people are taking their time to advertise their products or services within your board game product or service, you, you'll know people out there are, are watching. So that's the Chaz Marler uh, predictive flag for this, the health and state of the industry in the future. All right, so let's, let's take a pause here from, from talking about things that are absolutely really true and definitely will happen, to uh, more of what the chat has to say about things that we don't see um, in, in board games, because there's some overlap here. So instead of me going first, I think I'm gonna let the
the uh, the chat go first. Um, so the very first thing here, um, as is typical within this, um, our very first chat comes from um, long time, if not all time viewer, Kabuki Kid, who starts us off with a great nostalgic component you just don't see anymore, saying that I think I speak for all, and I do too, when I say that we all lament the loss of the Popomatic bubble. Uh, hashtag bring back Popomatic. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, the Popomatic bubble was a component from a game, I believe, called Trouble, where in the center of this board was this little bubble hot glued onto the board with a dice in it on a little bouncy piece of plastic. So what you would do is you would pop it down and the little plastic would push and when you let go of the tension, it would pop back up and the little dice would bounce around and would automatically roll the dice for you. I think personally that the reason why we do not see the pop matic bubble in today's society is because modern mobile phone app technology has made the Popomatic bubble, sadly, obsolete. Now, that said, I would pay real money for an app that was a not a dice rolling app, but a Popomatic Pop bubble app. In fact, I think there is a niche here, uh, a gap in our marketplace for not only an app, but an app that has a component that comes with it. Uh, you can have your phone and have a little acrylic bubble that goes over your phone. And so as you press on the acrylic bubble, it goes and actually replicates the little uh, dice roll on, on your phone there. My phone's not on, uh, mostly because the app doesn't exist. So I have no reason really to ever turn that phone on. But if the, if the Popomatic app complete with acrylic bubble uh, component did exist, I would certainly take the time to bother uh, charging my phone again. So, Popomatic Bubble, both virtual and real life component, uh, something you don't see anymore, um, and probably because of, ob uh, sadly, obsolescence. And um, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to pretend obsolescence is a word, even though I'm not sure. But let's continue on here. Um, <laughs> um, there's another comment right here, too, which, um, interestingly enough, is one I had on my list, but I took off of my own list because I thought, no one's going to know what I'm talking about. N no one's going to be able to, it's too obscure. But here it is, the second item in our in our chat today. S uh, stating, uh, well, Kabuki Kid uh, continues with, we all love and we all miss the traditional game pawns with the little flat bases and the skinny neck and the little round heads, uh, similar to a chess pawn from a Staunton set. Um, they were generic and boring, but oh, how we miss you. Uh, yeah, I, I, sorry um, has, is, that's what I was thinking of with those game pawns. Um, and some games of Parcheesi's that we, Parcheesi that we had growing up, um, they were ubiquitous. They, they were everywhere, they were in every game. Every game had these pawns. And games still have, you know, movers and player tokens and whatnots. So they're not obsolete like the Popo, Popomatic, stay strong, Popomatic app. They're not they're not obsolete like the Popomatic is, but they are uh, they have been usurped, replaced, if you will, I believe, by our friend, the Meeple. Um, meeples are not only meeples are so prevalent that they're not only now in just about every board game that requires a uh, little mover token, but um, there, you know, it's official word now in the dictionary. And if you're starting a podcast, the odds are really, really, really high that you're going to somehow include Meeple in the name of that board gaming podcast. So it's everywhere, not only in the games, but in our language and our podcast titles. And um, so this Meeple mania, um, which actually would make a great name for a podcast, uh, th this this meeple mania, I think, has replaced the uh, traditional uh, plastic big-headed player pawn that we all know and remember and miss so very, very much. What, what's interesting, too, is that um, 
you know, meeples have even started, we talked about this in a previous episode, meeples have started being created in custom shapes even within games. Instead of having the little wooden meeple that's always the little guy, you got, uh, for example, um, Scythe has uh, a different shaped meeple in a different position for each of the different players. And I wonder, um, I've wondered if that's such a thing that would be possible to do in plastic, because it seems like a majority of meeples are wood. I I've always wondered, is that just because that's the resources that are available to make the meeples out of? Or is it actually a design decision um, for stability and integrity of, of the meeple? I've wondered, why don't they make these meeples out of plastic? And I've started to, th you know, is it price? Or is it because the wood, uh, plastic would break, would plastic break easier than wood? is what I'm trying to say. These are the words I'm trying to communicate. I'm not using meeple enough, so it's not into my language enough here, so I need to say meeple a few more times in this description to really help get it out there. So I'm wondering if making the meeples out of plastic um, would actually be something that would fail because they'd be too brittle or break or, or if it's just a non-issue. So anyway, it's another whole nother avenue of this plastic pond discussion that I really can't believe that we're taking the time to discuss, but deep down inside, it actually makes me happy that um, I have this group of people to share this, these type of uh, questions with. So let's continue on to the, the next question here. Um, excellent, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you for a moment to chat because you're about to talk about the next thing that was on my list. Going back to my box that I've opened, my long, skinny, floppy box with its rules written on the inside of its box lid, I have now moved that box lid out of my way and I start looking at the components of this game from the 80s. And lo and behold, what is the first thing that I see, the first component that catches my eye and drags it across the room, that I see in this box the wonderful uh, sometimes pre-assembled for your convenience, cardboard and plastic spinner. You got the nice square piece of cardboard and then you got the little uh, ring that goes in the middle and then you got the spinner that has just enough give that it's not horizontal, but as you spin it, it's little sharp arrow will dig into the cardboard and either stop abruptly or catch and the whole piece of cardboard will just go flinging across your table and then you gotta go get it. They just don't make games with these car, these little spinners anymore. Uh, I can't think of, I can't, I can't think of the last modern board game that I have obtained that has a spinner in it. The, the only current game I can think that utilizes spinner technology is Twister. Uh, and, and you know, because as you know, Twister, the game with the big uh, flat, piece of plastic with all the colored dots on it that you put your hands and feet on, um, you know, and then it has the corresponding spinner where you spin the spinner and you call the shot and then Twister subsequently ties you up in a knot. That's the only game I can think of, you know, with, with a, that utilizes a spinner. Let's see if I'm uh, alone in this because let's go back over to the chat because, um, again, before we even started the, the show, spinners were being discussed in our YouTube live chat. Uh, Benjamin, Benjamin just puts it right out there. He, he just puts it on the table and says, I miss, no, that's not what he said at all. He's, he's not drunk, uh, so he's not slurring his typing. Uh, he says, I miss spinners. Um, followed, um, oh, followed by an example of a game that has a spinner. Uh, my new copy of Nuclear War still has the spinner. Woohoo, old school. Oh, so, ah, there we go. Is New, so um, it says new copy, so I'm assuming that this is a current current modern printing of Nuclear War and it still has the spinner in it. Uh, very, very, very interesting there. Um, okay, so I got the spinner and I think I've, I've maybe, the, maybe later we'll come back in the chat and we'll see if there's more spinner talk, but for the time being. We have the spinner, we've, we've kind of uh, looked at that and reminisced about it. So we put the spinner aside and, and the spinner is covering up the primary um, component in the box that you just don't see anymore. Because you got your long floppy box, and what else could your long floppy box be hiding within it but your long floppy board? This is a board 
from 19... Oh, does it have the date on here? Mm, oh, it does. 1985. This is a game I picked up recently at a thrift store. Um, this is uh, from a board game called uh, Flight Plan. Uh, this is a game, again, produced in 1985, and you can tell because it's got the single vertical seam in the board, making it um, unable to fit on your modern board gaming shelves and re re requiring you to have your long floppy box. But Flight Plan is a game from 1985 that actually is kind of like um, interest. It's actually a really good game. I picked it up at the thrift store. It's the only time I've ever seen it. But uh, it is it does have a page on Board Game Geek, so there's more information about it on Board Game Geek if you want. Uh, but Flight Plan is like this precursor to Airlines Europe. Um, you have all these cities, um, and you'll ha you actually have plastic planes and passengers. You'll put passengers all over the board. And you have these little plastic planes that the passengers actually can fit into, kind of like the uh, Game of Life cars with the little pegs. Um, so you'll take your planes around and you'll pick up these blue pegs and these pink pegs and you'll fly them around the board um, and, and uh, drop them off, pick them up and deliver them to their different destinations. So uh, like I said, it's like this weird precursor to Airlines Europe, except that it's not a stock management game. Um, it's a pick up and, del and deliver game. Um, there's, there's no stock involved. You're not actually making routes. You're just traveling around the board. Um, but it does, have, it does have planes in it. So um, in that respect, it's a precursor to Airlines Europe. Uh, oh, it's not in Europe either. See, yeah. Totally the same game, though, other than those, those differences. So you got your long, long, you got your long board. And your long board whee, is taken out of the box. And it's covering up the quintessential board game component from the 80s and, and, and big box board games and such. And that's the thing that you still see, but I wanted to discuss. And that's paper money. Your paper money is going to be under this board. And you're going to have your, and, and, and for paper money, I want to say specifically, like, you know, like the, the paper money in Monopoly or Monopoly. The, the paper money that's the thin colored paper that sticks together and crumples and you actually have to like sit there and roll it up and, and you know damage it in order to make it actually usable as money. But even then it's small and light. Paper money of course still exists. So this is where we're gonna get into this, uh, not just the archeology span aspect of today's episode this discussion, but also kind of talking about the future. Games still come out with paper money. But paper money is, I think, avoided as much as possible. Um, whenever a game designer these days can, it seems they do avoid paper money. And you have, you know, cardboard token, coin tokens, um, or even little rectangular cardboard tokens uh, for money that replace the paper money. You have, uh, you know, poker chips sometimes, cardboard or ceramic, plastic, clay, whatever. You have a playing card stock, actually. Playing cards replacing money more and more often. Uh, Las Vegas does. Uh, the Dice Tower, one of the uh, rewards in the Dice Tower Kickstarter this last year was um, including um, cards uh, of money to replace paper money. And that was actually the, uh, the promo in the, the Dice Tower Kickstarter that most caught my attention this year was their replacement for paper money with these little decks of cards of money. Um, can't wait for that to arrive. Um, and uh, cards, chits, uh, tokens. Um, um, and, and so it seems like every single possible way that places can replace paper money, they do. In fact, the only game of recent that I can think of that used paper money is uh, Millennium Blades. And it has paper money. But even they put the twist on it where instead of just passing around paper money, uh, you bundle up seven to ten of these uh, and you put a sticker around them so you actually make these little bundles, these wads of cash, and you're throwing the wads of cash around the table, which is actually oddly satisfying. And, I'll, and I hear the same thing over and over when people talk about Millennium Blades. They say, yes, this game has paper money, but the way they do it is really, actually really cool. So uh, that little twist, even though they're using the same paper money, light colored card uh, paper stock, they found a way to utilize it in an inventive, inventive way. So, um, so that's quite 
uh, quite a, a twist on it. But other than other than uh, Millennium Blades, um, I guess you know there are other games. Um, Lords of Vegas, I know, uses paper comes with paper money. A lot of people I know, though, because of the theme, will replace it with poker chips and use poker chips instead of the paper money. Um, and it seems like that's the first thing that people proxy. Um, but it also seems like it, that's one of those components. Um, like I was talking about, you know, things that publishers don't do because it's seen as a stigma. Uh, paper money seems to be like one of the current components that when paper money is included, there does seem to be this stigma associated with it. And the game is instantly downgraded a little bit in people's opinions. At least the opinions of, you know, the people really into board games, you know, that I uh, seem, you know, that I talk to a lot and everything. Maybe it's just this small little group of board gaming um, aficionados that care. And maybe no one else even notices. I don't know. But let's find out by going to other people and see what they notice, by going back to the chat now, I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna go through the chat and try to catch up now a little bit. So we're gonna go, speaking of archeology, span we're gonna go a few uh, layers back in the chat fossil record, and we're gonna see what people were talking about and catch back up, um, and then I'll come, up, uh, I'll come back to the uh, few things left on my list to close out the show. All right, returning to the chatteroony here, uh, we have, um, the right window in front of us. Okay, um, we also have here uh, roll and move is generally gone from games now, for the most part. If it's still used, it usually has ways to mitigate the rolls. Uh, yep, and continuing with the trend of uh, the uh, YouTube chat today, completely guessing what was on my list, um, roll and move actually was one of the items, one of the mechanisms, not components, in the mechanisms part on there, so yes, Roll, roll and move uh, seemed like in the 80s, every game that you had was roll and move or some concept of roll and move. And you know, whatever you, you rolled is what you had as your option that turn. Even sorry, it didn't use dice, but it was you know draw a card and move. You didn't have a choice, it was whatever came up. And that concept seems to be largely, you know, like I said, even if it is present, it seems to be, seems to be mitigated. Um, the most recent game I can think of that has the straightforward, old school, unmitigated roll and move concept in it is the uh, Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier game, which um, I actually like enough that it's um, included in my top 100 games of all time. Um, it's like number 91, I believe. Uh, it's a really good game. Um, it's a good family game. Um, and I recommend checking out uh, what I have to say about it in that Top 100 episode that came out this week. But uh, the, the main thing, the primary thing that if I could change about this pro Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier game is that on your turn you roll a dice and that's the maximum number of movement points that you have available on your turn. To me, that's the part of the game that seems clunky and I would like to house rule or change if I you know, if we could find, figure out a better way to do it. Um, even if you had like a hand of five, three to five cards, each with a different speed, and you just had to play them, you know, one is one speed, one is two speed, so on and so forth, up to like five speed, and you just had to choose which card to play, and after you played all five, you scoop them all up. Um, but you know, even if you had that going on, that might be a more interesting decision-y way to, to approach the game. But anyway, that's the most recent game I can think of that has the old school, unmitigated roll and move mechanism into it. And it's just one you don't see very much often anymore. And I think it isn't seen very much anymore because it's definitely something that modern techniques and modern design um, ideas have made obsolete in a lot of ways. Okay, let's continue on to uh, Sasha, who is a show regular, who takes the time to write, I don't think that I miss much when it comes to board games. At least nothing comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> the games did get better rules and components over the years. Maybe the chat is able to come up with something that I miss. All right, oops, well, let's redo our search and find out if the chat does, in fact, come up with something that you have missed. Um, let's see. Um, 20-sided turtle, hello, sir. 
um, who I got the privilege to meet at Gen Con. 20 sided turtle mentions maybe this is a generational thing, but it doesn't seem like many games use grand components anymore. The Dark Tower from the from Dark Tower, or the giant island from Fireball Island, or the like. So I think I assume what you're talking about is these giant plastic molded pieces that take up the entire board, and they're sitting there, and uh, like the Game of Life even, that has all of those big mountains on the board, but a better example actually is the ones you gave, like the giant island from Fireball Island, where the entire board is just this big molded piece of plastic. Um, it, that That is true. That isn't something that you see as often. Um, I wonder if that is a, like you said, a generational thing, or if it's due to changes in the cost of materials. Uh, that would be interesting to find out. Um, I know there was, oh, I can't remember the name of the game. I apologize. It was several months ago. Man, maybe even um, last uh, maybe even in May or June, uh, maybe that long ago, maybe last May or June, uh, on the Dice Tower Audio Podcast, I remember Tom and Eric were discussing some game, was it by Splatter? I can't remember who, but it was some game about uh, climbing a mountain, and they had this big, huge mountain in it, the, like you're mentioning, a big component that you actually put your pieces on, but it was completely superfluous. It was not even necessary for the gameplay. It was just this thing that you could put on there almost for scorekeeping or record keeping or something. And, and the game did not get stellar reviews, as I recall. And, and I'm wondering if that was one of those things where if the game had gotten better reviews, could that type of thing, and, and more games did that and got good reviews, could that set a precedent uh, a fad, almost, of these big unnecessary components being included in games. But from those games not getting stellar reviews, is that something that just may, might pop up every now and then? Like, is it, like you mentioned, is it a generational thing? I'm wondering, is it a, you know, is a cultural marketing fad-like like thing, too? Um, which is an interesting, interesting uh, thing to try and find out more more about. I'm wondering if it's just price or if it's if it's like that. Uh, but thank you for the uh, intriguing thought experiment there. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Kabuki mentions. What about games? Oh, what about games based on any sitcom or TV show that you can think of? You know, usually terrible games relying entirely on an IP or intellectual property. Uh, I'm looking at you, Bionic Woman, from my ch from my childhood. Ooh, there was a Bionic Woman board game. Oh, that sounds horrible. Um, yeah, that th the that is a really good point that fits this topic of board game archaeology fantastically. Uh, it, it seems like long long ago when the Earth was green in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, there were a lot of, of games that came out from IPs. You know, every every IP that was available kind of had some horrible roll and move board game uh, that came out. And now those games are fortunately you know buried under uh, you know under layers and layers of board game sediment uh, to be er unearthed and you know featured in a thrift sift or a flip the table episode. Um, so we at least can use them for entertainment value now. But th but due to these lackluster games based on uh, popular IPs that were coming out, you, uh, you had a stigma. Uh, a lot of for a long time, you had the games that you know IPs were avoided, and there was a stigma. And I think, um, m in my opinion, the company Gale Force Nine, who has developed um, really good games based on uh, the Spartacus TV show and uh, Sons of Anarchy. Um, even though I haven't watched that show, the game is fantastic, but it's based on, on the IP of the show. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on all uh, Firefly and um, at least a half dozen other games at this point that they've developed on IPs. And Gale Force 9, I think, has led the way to r helping remove the stigma associated with board games based on on television and movie IPs. I think the work that they have done and the quality of games that they've produced have, have led the charge in changing that, that stigma. But yes, you find a Bionic Woman board game though, it's definitely gonna be one from this era um, that 
they just don't make games like that anymore. I and I think partially because of uh, I don't want to say they wouldn't sell because that's the whole reason of getting an IP, isn't it? You get that so you can piggyback your sales off the popularity of that IP. Uh, I think it's just one of those things where it was uh, uh, the quality of those was such indicative that interest in them definitely did wane over time to the point where they kind of became a joke. And when that happens, you got to stop and think and come up with something new because you can't ride that wave as easily anymore as, as you once did. Okay. Um, okay. Forget Bionic Woman. Um, Kabuki Kid mentioned, finishes off her thought just by mentioning that uh, I think I had the Welcome Back Cotter game too. I think I had a relative that had that, and I think I remember seeing that. And that fascinates me and frightens me at the same time. Um, okay, I gotta make a mental note here. I gotta go look up the Welcome Back Cotter game on Board Game Geek after this episode's over. Okay, uh, David mentions long boxes became unnecessary when boards evolved to have more than one fold. Exactly, and I wonder, I don't know, but I, I was thinking about this, when did that happen? Was it something that just new production techniques at the printer became available? And they said, hey, we have this new way of folding these games. Was it something that other industries were doing and the board game industry started doing because the technology became available? Is it because the printing process is better? Is it because the long materials, you know, they upgraded their machinery and these didn't uh, didn't go through their machinery anymore and they had to cut them and it was just a happy accident? Um, is it because uh, people wanted their games to look different and be in a different size box to differentiate them away from the old school games? There's, there's just a, a million different questions of why. What caused the change from the long vertical seam to the multi-cut boards that we have today? Um, I, I, I'm, 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 it's probably unhealthy, but I do have this fascination with that. What is it that led to that change? And I honestly have no idea w what led to it, um, if it was just a general evolution or there, if there's a specific reason. But if anyone out there does know, uh, let me know in the comments below or, or the chat, um, because I'd love to dig into that and, and even like do a segment, um, a Head in the Cloud segment or something about it, uh, because I can't be the only one who's had these questions, right? Right? Okay, speaking of questions, let's move on to the next question or statement here from the uh, chat. Um, Oh, no, it jumped. Okay, oh, what about cards that are printed in sheets that you have to tear apart on their perforated lines? Oh, oh, I I hate those. Um, in fact, uh, the, the most recent game that I have, it actually is the very, very the most recent game I have that suffers from that problem is uh, uh, the very first game I did a video about, actually, called Dinosaur Bingo. And Dinosaur Bingo had the sheets of the, th they're a card stock, but they're thin and they're horrible and you actually punch them out, they're perforated, and so you have your stack of cards. But even after you punch them out and you have your deck of cards, due to the perforation, there's still the little bumps that go around the outside of those cards. And it's so bothersome and so prevalent, I actually, you notice it after a while. Um, there is a there is a product that I picked up at Gen Con. It was a, a promo for a game. Um, it was additional cards for it. And I don't wanna say the name of the game just in case I'm wrong, because I wanna go and, and research this. But it was basically a promo of cards that you could add to the base game. But when they gave me the pack, this little shrink-wrapped uh, pack of promo cards, I noticed these little bumps around the edges of the cards. And I remember right there when I picked them up at Gen Con, the thought crossed my mind. Were these die cut or were these printed in sheets and punched out you know, out of a perforated sheet? And so I haven't been able to do it yet. I, I have the pack, I put it in my game box, but I haven't compared. I want to compare the promo cards to the original cards that came with the game to see if the original cards have the same outside edge texture because like I said if, if, if it is it's a sign that these were perforated printed off perforated sheets and punched out and 
And if so, it's just enough of a difference that you can tell. And if they are shuffled into the other cards and sat there to draw from, the players who know what to look for will be able to tell if one of the new promo cards from this perforated sheet are coming up on the deck next, or if the, or if the top of the deck is one of the original cards. It's that much of a subtle difference if you know what to look for. So I'm curious about that. And if that is the case, that leads into a whole other you know, thing of discussion. How many hoops are, are publishers going to have to jump through to retain the same level of quality in future materials that they make? Because you're never going to be able to match everything perfectly. So, but anyway, that's a whole other sidebar discussion right there. Let's continue on catching up with our comments first, though. Um, uh, Benjamin mentions, you could have fit the rules of Suro on the box hood. Suro, yeah, you're exactly right. Suro is another fantastic game, which the, the concepts of the game are so elegant and streamlined and simple that you probably could fit the, the instructions for it on the box lid. We should make a list, like a start a uh, geek list on Board Game Geek of games whose rules potentially would fit on the box lid interior. Uh, I wonder how many games out there um, actually would fit that bill. Um, Michael mentions... Looking to the future, will punch-outs go the way of the dinosaur? Uh, take games like Scythe, which is mostly meeples, tokens, and minis. The coins are only the only thing that's punched out. Oh, so punch boards themselves. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Uh, my personal opinion, I don't think that punch boards are going to go away anytime soon because uh, printing up the cardboard... Because here's why. Y using Scythe... Uh, your game that you mentioned as your, as your example, continuing that game as the one in the example, inside it seems like the punch board was used to provide all of the components that couldn't otherwise be produced in other ways. You got your you, know, you got your uh, your meeples, your player sheets, uh, your your figures, everything else, but the coins and and all the other little things that. Um, weren't able to be made as a meeple or figure or some other nice component, they made as a punch board. So the punch board is kind of like the lowest common denominator. Uh, the punch board, you, know, you, can have, you can have really nice punch board components, don't get me wrong. You can have awesome, uh, fantastic ones. So I'm not saying punch board is bad, I'm just saying it seems to be the lowest common denominator when it comes to production. Uh, if you can't make something in another way, you can always make it as a punch board component. So until something comes along that is higher quality and or less expensive to print than punch board, I don't see it going away anytime soon because it definitely has a purpose and that it serves in board game printing. So there you go. There's, so it's possible, but I don't see it happening anytime soon until a definitively better alternative comes along. Uh, thank you, Michael, though. The very excellent um, thought there, though. Um, Okay, sorry, I uh, jumped again. Michael uh, says, I actually liked the idea of having the instructions on the box. Hey, hey, there we go. People like box uh, top instructions. Uh, rules changes with the next printing are easier to handle if it's printed on a separate sheet. Oh, there we go. We have errata with future printings. Hmm, that is a good point. Rules changes and such are easier to change if it's not on the box interior. Is it though? Because you still have to change the files. You have to change the, uh, t the documents for the rule books. And when you go to the printer, the interior of the box will be just another document that you have to change. So you're still editing documents um, to be sent to the printer. So oh, no, I'm, I've, re I've reversed my opinion on that. I'm not sure that printing the box is, um, I'm not, I am no longer positive that printing the rules on a separate pamphlet or document is actually easier in the long run for the printer and the designer than printing it on the box top. So touche. Uh, uh, so she won that for a while and we'll see what uh, what's next in the comments here. Um, Draken Icebex, Dra <laughs> I apologize for butchering your moniker there, um, but Draken Icebex mentions tiny epic games have pictures posted on the issues of their boxes. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to assume issues means interiors. 
Um, and there was an autocorrect error there. So Tiny Epic Games have pictures posted on the interiors of their boxes. Interesting. I have not seen that. I will have to check that out. Uh, Tiny Epic Games may be leading the way in this board game modernization in the future that I was talking about earlier. So they may be the first ones that open that door. Uh, Michael mentions, and if they evolve to metal coins, then that's not even needed as a punch out. Uh, I think that was, was referring to, to Scythe there as well. Um, so let's, let's continue on to a new thought here. Um, Faramir the Ranger um, mentions to us that what about the, pre the pre meeple days with all the same looking plastic or wooden pawns? Um, yep, uh, Faramir, um, I, I agree completely. And if you go and rewind back to the beginning of this episode, I had like a 10 minute tirade on that very thing. Um, and other people in the comments mentioned it too. So yes, you're not alone in that thought. That, um, that is on many people's minds when they, they come up for this discussion. Um, the pre-meeple days. Uh, hey, pre-meeple days. Another potential podcast name right there. Uh, dig it. Okay. Um, Kabuki mentions again, oh, what about cardboard components that you actually cut out with scissors? Uh, I think we all missed that. Oh, wow. Cardboard components that you actually cut out with scissors. Now that is rare these days. And in fact, going back in time, I, I, have, a tr I have trouble even thinking about ones that you manually cut out uh, from a board game. Um, example, please. Any example that you can provide on that, a game where you actually had to cut out the components with scissors, uh, let me know, because I'm drawing a blank on any, but I'm sure there were some out there. But wow, now that, that is old school. Okay, um, round to it. Um, uh, rolls by to mention, uh, speaking of grand components, what about pieces physically attached to the board or games that had to be built, like Mousetrap or Rock Jocks? Oh, Mousetrap, yes. Uh, and and, and uh, pieces, plastic pieces physically in the board. Again, that goes to the game of life with its little mountains and stuff. Yeah, that's something you don't see anymore uh, as much uh, because I think that was a giant pain to put together. Um, for example, the, the modern game that I think that has fallen into that trap. And yes, I think it is a trap and not just a mouse trap, but an actual design trap because game of life you could never shut that board correctly and if you once you did you just had to stuff all the components inside and they'd rattle around inside because the way that the board shut with those mountains made it so you couldn't actually have an insert in there and you just had everything rattling around so uh f games like the game of life or or, or mousetrap with all of its pieces that you put together and then they just fall over um i think the modern board game that most closely falls into that design trap is Camel Up. Camel Up came with this little pyramid, pyramid shape, uh, this little cardboard pyramid that used cardboard and rubber bands and a three-part diagram to assign, uh, to instruct you how to construct this little uh, cardboard pyramid that was hollow, that you would put the dice in and actually had a little door that would slide open, hello, and you would put the dice in there and close the door, rattle up, turn it upside down, press the lever to open up that little door, a dice would poop out, and then that's how you rolled the dice. I gotta be honest with you, I enjoy Camel Up. I own a copy of Camel Up. I never even bothered putting that pyramid together in my own copy of it. Um, I got a black dice bag cloth little black dice bag, and that's what we use instead of the little pyramid. And I don't miss that pyramid at all because like the components uh, that uh, round to it described, I think that the pyramid in Camel Up was more trouble than it was worth and is the closest thing I think we have to uh, the, the design blunder of those days gone by. Big, scary word. Uh, Strong words there from some uh, guy on a webcam. Okay, so, but um, yeah, I, I, I agree that the grand component thing though, ebbs and flows, but there, there's my, my take on it. Um, okay, 10 minutes left. So we're entering the lightning round. I'm gonna try and zip through uh, a lot of these. Um, 
uh, excellent discussion today. I really always appreciate it. But let's see uh, how many people's comments I can get through um, before we run out of time. Uh, Stryker continues the box top uh, discussion with the box top interior is reserved to track high scores. Seems to be especially true for Catan. That is true. There is the uh, sub sub hobby of the hobby um, called box topping where you utilize the space within the box top to record your game plays and who won and you know the history of the game, which I do not do, but I think is cool when people do it. But if the instructions were printed on the interior of the box, they could include they could include a pad of paper or on the back of the rule book. In fact, Scythe and one other recent game just printed this summer, I can think of at least two games that have included uh, sheets or back of the rule book to track your gameplays and achievements and such. But I think I, that's which I think is cool. Uh, having a, an achievement system that you can track is just I think something I, I hope I see more and more of in, in, in board games because that's cool. But that's a whole other topic of discussion. With this topic of discussion, we continue with Sasha, who mentions that the, the rules on the box cover are harder to read, and most to most people it would seem like the company tries to save money. So I guess with better components, companies try to avoid that. That is true. It is easier to pass around and read a uh, booklet than it is to try and read this uh, inverted box top. So um, definitely um, th might be one of the reasons why printing and games have evolved away from that. I definitely agree. 20-sided turtle uh, rolls in as well to say, here's a use for box tops, a chart for how to use the insert. I have pictures of blood rage so I don't forget. Boom, mind blown. There you go. Utilizing the box top to, to, destroy, to, to destroy, to to have a chart for how to use the insert. Um, if Favor of the Pharaoh had that, I would have gone out and bought two copies of the game just out of appreciation for it. Um, excellent use of space. Uh, Kabuki continues, um, unless we're talking uh, GW, most all games no longer have their plastic bits come on sprues. Uh, Games Workshop being GW there. Um, plastic sprues, that is definitely something that has, has uh, gone by the wayside. Even um, unassembled minis, it seems. It seems like more and more, even when you have complex miniatures, um, Super Dungeon Explorer seems to be the most recent one I can think of that had large miniatures that you actually had to assemble. And people always complained, you know, uh, half-heartedly, kind of for fun complained, you know, about having to put together, assemble these miniatures. And I know that their more recent releases have been pre-assembled, I believe. And other games. So it seems, seems even, not just sprues, but even just being unassembled at all seems to be something that's going by the wayside. So that's a really, really good one. Um, Let's see here. Uh, K mentions, or Key mentions, there are a few games that have advertising on the sides of the bottom of games. Yes. And I hate it, says K. I believe that Resistance Avalon is one of those games. Um, yeah, I've noticed the ads going along. And of course, when you close the box, you don't see them. Open up the box, and that's when you see them. So it seems like it um, might be annoying, but it is, I think, of all places, an appropriate place to put advertising. Cardboard Stacker continues, um, or Cardboard Stacker interjects, uh, types words I'm about to read that say, some publishers, like Fantasy Flight Games, put advertisements on the side of their boxes as well, on the lower, or on the lower box. So, okay, it's not, um, it's not just one publisher. There are multiple publishers that are doing it. How long until those ads creep into the un unutilized space of the box top interior? Um, Trevor mentions that I just bought a game, a Haba game, and it included a pamphlet for stuffed animals, kid toys, etc. Hashtag, it's happening. There we go. But that's a pamphlet in, in added. I, I, I have uh, Fantasy Flight Games every now and then has uh, pamphlets. I guess it's their catalog, but some things. Uh, I have seen that periodically, but you're right. Stuffed animals and kids toys, totally different market. Uh, could this be a precursor of things to come? We'll find out. Um, oh, and just going back, just in case you were wondering about our initial pop matic discussion, not only Trouble, but the game Headache also utilized the pop matic So for all you pop matic um, historians, um, 
uh, the game Headache is another one to, to check out there. Uh, thank you. Um, wow, a lot of Popomatic talk. Um, Popomatic, Popomatic. Okay, I want to, with the five minutes we have left, I want to get other people that um, have other uh, non Popomatic. Uh, Ravensburger, uh, Trevor also mentions just bought a Ravensburger game, then it has a pamphlet for puzzles. Um, uh, F Faramir the Ranger also asks, is it just me, or do board games these days tend to have expansions, whereas Risk, Monopoly, Life, and Mousetrap don't? Oh, ho, ho, ho. there you go. That's one I didn't even think of for my list. Um, you're right. Uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, a couple episodes ago, uh, about expansions becoming not only commonplace, but almost expected. Um, yes, ex where those old games might make different versions, but even that took a while. That didn't even start happening until late 80s, it seems. Um, yes, expansions definitely are something that seems to evolve. And if you go back in the archaeological record of board games, you won't see expansions like you do these days. So that's a really good one. Um, let's see. Uh, Avalon Hill Games, Someone uh, Kabuki mentions Avalon Hill Games had expansions, but really, yeah, those are the, uh, the main ones that people can think of. Um, Michael mentions an RPG dice board, a dice rolling gadget for modern age on Kickstarter from April or May. It didn't fund, but it's the popper with versatility. Oh, there we go. More, more popomatic, more popomatic talk. I might just have to make an entire episode where we can just share our popomatic nostalgia because, um, that seems to be something that, um, there's enough content here to maybe make an entire mini-series. We could make a, maybe a nice PBS-style mini-series about the history of the pop matic And I think, uh, I for one, um, am excited at the, the idea. I, I think we could pull it off. So um, thank you everyone for giving us um, horribly fantastic ideas for future uh, board game video content. Uh, pop matic with a D20 inside. Okay, I'm giving up now. I'm just gonna go through the pop matic comments. Um, pop matic bubble with a D20 inside would be pretty cool. Um, I'd buy one for as a standalone for nostalgic sake only. Um, sure, I probably would too. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. Now I'm looking for pop matic comments. Uh, I don't see one, but um, uh, Kabuki Kid Wonders, um, I wonder what the first board game expansion was. Ooh, now that would be a very interesting uh, very interesting thing to find out. Yes, what was the first thing that qualifies as the ac an actual board game expansion? Um, Sacha mentions, um, Sacha, not a friend of Meeple's, uh, states that the Meeple is not my friend. I want the Popple back, um, the classic pawn. Wow, it had Popple, huh? Uh, the classic, and yes, we already had a word for that. So, uh, P-O-P-P-E-L, O having the two dots over it, uh, the popel, pop, 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 popel. Um, I'll have to go online and find the proper pronunciation of that. But apparently, the little flat bodied, skinny necked, round headed top uh, player pawns have an official name, the popel. Yeah. You, you can come by this show and learn stuff that now you never knew that you didn't know there was a word for. Um, and fill up on your daily dose of popomatic facts. Um, it's the metagame. Um, all bases are covered here for your board gaming needs. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time today to cover those needs. Um, so I want to close out the show by uh, thanking everyone who has uh, provided a fantastic chat log to continue on. I, I think we only got like two thirds through the chat questions and stuff today. So I, I'm sorry. I may have gone off on a few tangents there. Um, maybe more than usual, probably the same usual typical number of, of, of tangents. But anyway, went off on a few rabbit trails there. But um, it was a really fun, um, interesting discussion. It's such a light, silly topic. Tried to have a lot of fun with it today. So I hope that you enjoyed our time together. Until the next time, that we can enjoy some time together um, playing the metagame. Uh, be sure that you pop by our friends at the Dice Tower and the Pair of Dice Paradise YouTube channels and subscribe and also follow us on YouTube, 
which I just mentioned, and Facebook and Twitter as well, uh, because those are great places to continue the discussion. Until we do that, uh, I've been Chaz Marler, who, along with the YouTube live chat, has been playing the metagame. Thanks, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.